You know, there's a lot going on in the world around us today. You can tell by this mask going on that there's a virus out there. I don't think I need this right now. You're probably not going to catch anything from me through the television. But we're in a, a very strange time in our world today. A virus out there, a thing so small you can't even see it under a regular microscope, and yet it's changed our world. We're coming out of the midst of a really contentious political situation. We're coming out of the midst of social unrest. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how to treat each other in this world. With all of that turmoil, with all of that stress, we find ourselves not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go, not knowing how to behave. And yet, it's Advent. You say, well, what in the world is Advent? Advent is a very special time of the year. It's the very first season on the Christian calendar. That time when the church stops and pauses to remember who we really are and why we really exist. Because you see, Advent is about anticipation. It's anticipating the coming of the Savior. Anticipating that one who was to come and be the Savior for the nation of Israel. And that one who we find through prophecy was to be the Savior for all the world. But it's also a time for us to stop and remember that our King is coming. You see, after His resurrection, Jesus went back into heaven telling us that He would come again. In our communion liturgy, we say that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And we anticipate that in Advent. So it's a twofold anticipation as we look at not only the run up to Christmas, if you will, where we're waiting for the birth of the baby Jesus, but we're also looking for the return of Jesus our Lord and our King. So what is Advent really? Most people look at Advent, if they even recognize that it happens, most people look at it as simply a time when they're, they're filled with dread of a holiday that they know they can't afford to buy for. Some are filled with a heartbreak of knowing that they're not going to be able to put even a few simple gifts under the tree for their children on Christmas morning. Others are shaking their heads wondering how in the world they're going to deal with those family gatherings where everybody is on, is, is on pins and needles waiting for the sparks to start flying while others are anticipating a time when they get together with friends and family and they, they remember all of the wonderful Christmases, the loving times together that they've had over the years. Others will mourn because a person who was with them last Christmas won't be at the table this Christmas. As I say, it's a strange time because of all that's going on in the world around us. It really has nothing to do with Advent. But we see all these things that seem to take away from us that sense of anticipation. We're so focused on what's happening every day, right here, right now, until we forget that there's something out there for us to expect, something for us to anticipate. Advent comes from a Latin word that simply means coming. Jesus was coming to be the Savior. Jesus is coming to be our King. So. In this Advent time, we anticipate those things. Now, all this talk about anticipation makes me think about something else. So let's talk about hope. On Advent, the first Sunday in Advent, we light a candle, a purple candle. Some churches use blue in an Advent wreath, and that candle symbolizes hope. Now, what is this thing about hope? Why do we talk about hope with Advent? As I say, it's a, it's a matter of anticipation. We're looking forward to the coming of our Savior. We're looking forward to the second coming of our King. Hope is something that is endemic to the human condition. Humanity has a huge capacity for hope. We're born into this world hoping for something. When I was a boy, I hoped for Christmas every year. Most of us do. We hope. Our hope is set for us. We, you know, we enter into a marriage hoping that we can spend our life with that partner. We enter into the lifetime task of raising children with hope. We retire from jobs hoping that we'll be able to enjoy those retirement years, our golden years, as it were. Hope is something that springs, as the poets say, eternal in the human breast. But hope is essential to the human existence. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian, the Nobel Prize winning Ru Russian author, from his years of experience in the Russian gulag, the prison camps where the political prisoners were put, 
Solzhenitsyn observed that those who had hope were the ones who had the best opportunity, the best chance to survive. Those without hope generally didn't make it. Those who have no hope in our society today wind up in addictions and bad relationships. They wind up marrying themselves, if, as it were, to a great many things that are detrimental to them because they just can't see a way out. Those who call, fall into a sense of, into a situation of complete hopelessness are more susceptible to taking their own lives. Hope is important for us. We can go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about hope. We could begin in Genesis 1, where God created the heavens and the earth, hoping for the creation that was to come, hoping for the fellowship that He would have with mankind. We could go to Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve were given hope as God promised them a Savior. We could look at Noah, who ushered his family and all the animals into an ark, the ark that God had had him construct to save he and his family and all of, all of animal life on the earth from the flood. But I want to start talking about hope really more specifically with a fellow by the name of Abraham. Abraham was a wealthy man in ancient Mesopotamia. Abraham was given a, a command. I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave your family. I want you to go to a place that I'm going to show you and there, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give you that land, and I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham passed that hope down through the generations. Even those today who look toward Canaan, toward Palestine as a homeland, look in that same hope to the promise that was given to Abraham. But there was more than the promise of land that was given to Abraham. God told him, I'm going to, through your, through your descendants, I'm going to bless all the earth the promise of a coming Savior. And that promise has endured down through the annals of history. 2,000 years later, in the land of Palestine, in the land of Israel, that Savior would come. And we hope, as they did, for that Savior. Well, what's, what goes on with hope? What, what does hope produce? Hope produces for us when we really have hope, not just a wishful thinking, but real hope, hoping for something we know is going to happen. When we have that hope, it produces peace in our hearts. No matter what the circumstances around us tell us, that peace comes to us. That peace is ours because our hopes are set in the promises of God. Because God has told us, this is what I'm going to do. And we can see from past history, this is what God has done. It's been said that hope is not real without precedent. There has to be something that says, yes, this hope is real. So we look to peace. And the second candle that we light on the second Sunday in Advent is the candle of peace. Peace that only God can give. Peace that only comes from knowing that we exist in the hope that God has given us. That peace produces for us joy. When our hearts are at peace, when our hearts are stayed on the promises of God, because our hopes are steadfastly fixed in Him, because we know that God is faithful, it produces joy in us. When the promises of God are fulfilled in us, there's joy. We have that joy because God has been faithful to His promise. He's given us hope. He's given us peace as we've, in, as we've engaged with that hope, as we've tasted, as we've claimed that hope as ours, as what is real for us. It produces joy in our hearts. In Acts chapter 8, we read about a man who came from Ethiopia in Africa to Jerusalem to worship. And as he was returning to Ethiopia, he was riding along in his carriage, his chariot, the King James Bible says, reading from the prophet Isaiah. And it's obvious from what we see there that the man had, even though he'd been to Jerusalem to worship, he really didn't understand what was going on. A man named Philip had been sent by the Holy Spirit to that man. And as he walked beside this man's carriage and listened to him read, he asked him, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I understand unless somebody guides me, unless someone teaches me? So Philip began to teach him. He taught him from Isaiah 53 about the Savior, the one who gave his life so that our sins could be forgiven. And the man believed. Philip baptized him. Philip was taken away by the Holy Spirit, but the scriptures tell us that that, that Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing. The promises of God had become reality to him, and he rejoiced. There was joy 
because he knew those promises were real. He knew that God was faithful to his promises. In this time of Advent, we hope for the Savior who's to come. We hope for that King that we know is coming. We have joy in our hearts because there's been peace given to us through the recognition of those hopes and the faithfulness of God to realize those hopes. But that produces something else for us. It produces in us a knowledge of God's love. On the fourth Sunday in Advent, we light the ultimate candle, the candle of love. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, this is really love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the payment for our sins. We know we're loved because of what God has done for us. God has not only given us life, He's not only blessed us, especially here in America, with being the richest people on the face of the earth, but He's also blessed us with His love. His love is manifested in that Jesus came and gave His life for us while we were still sinners, while we were still hostile to Him. He gave His life so that we could be forgiven, so that the promises of God could be realized and we could have the joy, the same joy that that Ethiopian had. That joy that says, God has given me life. God has given me, has taken all the hope that I've had and turned it into glad fruition. That hope, that joy, that peace, that love that God has given us. We love God, we say, and yet we wonder how do we know we love God? Jesus told his disciples, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, he wasn't giving them a, a command to say, keep these commandments or else you don't love me. It was not a matter of performance. He was saying, because you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. I'll give you an example of that. When I first met my wife and fell in love with her, I did everything that I could possibly do to please her. Not because I was afraid she wouldn't love me if I didn't please her, but because I just wanted to please her. I gave her every gift I could afford and some that I couldn't afford. <laughs> I did everything for her that I thought she would possibly want me to do. I did everything in my power to make her happy because I loved her. And because I still love her, I still do the same thing. Not perfectly, <laughs> but I do as best I can. That's the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. Because you love me, you're going to do what I ask you to do. Because you love me, you're going to want to please me. Because you love me, you're going to want to be as much like me as you possibly can. If you love me, he said, you'll keep my commandments. It's clear that God's loved us, and we love him as we strive to be pleasing to him. The Apostle Paul said, we have as our ambition to be pleasing to God. We love him, therefore we want to please him. So it's not just God loving us. It's us, us loving God in return because God has loved us. Because God has blessed us with such wonderful gifts, we love Him. And that is what Advent is about. The hope, the peace, the joy, the love that's been given us. But what does that look like? You know, this time of the year, as I say, Advent, in, in a very real sense, is a run-up to Christmas. We know four weeks after, the, after Advent begins, four Sundays, Christmas will come soon after. But what does that Christmas story look like? That first day that God gave His gift to the world. I want to read to you from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 2. Very familiar story. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. 
And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the angel has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the sayings that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The promise of a coming Savior, fulfilled with the words of the angel, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This night, this wondrous night, is the culmination of all the hopes of all the ages. The promise of the coming Prince of Peace. The promise of one who would give great joy to the people because their sins were forgiven, because their future was secured. This night that proves to us that God loved us enough to give His only Son. But what if this night had not been? If this night had not been, if God had not chosen to come to earth in Jesus, where would our hope be? If this night had not been, if God had not chosen to come to earth in Jesus, how would we know peace? If this night had not been, if God had not chosen to come to earth in Jesus, how could we know joy beyond our circumstances? If this night had not been, if God had not chosen to come to earth in Jesus, how would we know of His immeasurable love? If this night had not been, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Go now in wonder. Go to bring hope to those in darkness, the magic of peace to those steeped in realism, joy to those who can find no joy, and love to a world filled with hate and despair. Go with the songs of the angels in your ears and the love of God in your hearts. Go and spread the word. The babe of Bethlehem is born for all. Thank you.